some weeks ago a report in EIR entitled, Why Americans Don't Respond to Reality. The Power of Truth Can Overthrow the Russellite Dictatorship. And the purpose of the article was to address what is it about Americans at this moment of history which has crippled most of the American population in addressing the reality, the manifest reality, where we have an opportunity as Ben Franklin and Hamilton and company organized and mobilized to defeat the British Empire, which they did in terms of the establishment of a constitutional republic and the science of physical economy under Hamilton, but that the consolidation of that revolutionary victory was not, this was not consolidated. We can go through the history perhaps later. Uh, but now you have the situation in which, as a result in the wake of Roosevelt's death and the Trumanism, McCarthyism of the post-war period, and the effects of the murder of Kennedy and the paradigm shift to hell of the post-63 period, and then the, the takedown of Glass-Steagall, the post-Glass-Steagall and post-9-11 era of Patriot Act, warrantless surveillance, impulse for police state, regime change wars, uh, financial disintegration, so on. Now you have on the one side the imminence of the guns of August, of an extraordinary danger of war, of nuclear war. At the same time, this is the end of the British Empire, one way or the other. If they blow themselves up, it's the end of the empire. Uh, but um, alternatively, insofar as that empire is finished, the old era, the old paradigm is self-destroyed. Therefore, the potential to bring into being the new one is unprecedented. And yet, by and large, Americans are not, either Americans are insane about this party or that party, or Americans are saying both parties are insane, both parties are failing, but what can you do about it? And there's a process which was, for purposes of this discussion, initiated by Bertrand Russell, the most evil man of the 20th century, a process over the last century plus, which has created a degree of social control, a degree of brainwashing and self-brainwashing of an American populace, such that by and large Americans are not prepared for this moment. And I would challenge the people here that in the last two weeks, we have raised the question of a broadsheet in the Manhattan Project of the circulation uh, of a mass petition leading into the living memorial of 9-11 and built upon the victory with the 28 pages declassified. And the response from the Manhattan Project, if you will, at the last two Saturday meetings has been underwhelming. That is, when Diane asked last week about the circulation of the petition, there was apparently one signature secured in the week leading into last Saturday. Uh, the, this, is, this is a problem, and I would raise a couple of things that are developed by Dave Christie and Bob Ingram in this report. They quote Bertrand Russell from 1951. I think the subject which will be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils have left school, they shall be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. When the technique has been perfected, every government that's been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. That you now have a depth of social control in terms of social networking, mass media, and so on, which is in the Obama period unprecedented, and which the attempt of the oligarchy, of the so-called gay masters in this presidential campaign, is to impose such further control. One of the elements of this is their uh, age-old commitment, intensifying in the last 50 years or so, of eliminating the cognitive generators 
people like Lyndon LaRouche. That if you think about what LaRouche did in the Reagan period, in coming into and being brought in in the late 70s and through the Reagan first years of the Reagan administration, being brought into the US presidency and generating an idea, the power of reason, an idea which Reagan adopted, which uh, had it been developed further, would have ended the era of nuclear madness and would have created uh, a, a, an end to the Cold War, an international alliance, US-Soviet Union, based on new physical principles, based on scientific discovery and revolution, by which the US, the Soviet Union, would have driven forward the entire world economy. Reagan was shot when he brought, in 81 when he brought LaRouche into the presidency. LaRouche was framed up, and the attempt was to wipe out this organization. But the consolidation of that process, if you will, with Obama is that you have now an American, a, a White House under the unitary executive, the Bush-Cheney administration, the Obama administration, a unitary executive which is largely devoid of functional presidency as an institution. That is to say that key people inside the institutions of government, inside the diplomatic corps, the intelligence community, the military, think uh, thinkers of the united states have have largely been marginalized by this post glass steagall and post 9 11 period uh, uh, in such a way that you have this attempt for a unitary executive uh, and much of the uh, operation has been to take thinkers particularly thinkers like lyndon larouche and marginalize them or eliminate them well while all this has been going on here larouche's ideas have taken over much of the world. And as the crisis deepens across both sides of the Atlantic, then the potential which comes from the G20, from, from the Chinese leadership, from Putin's initiatives on actually organizing a new international alliance to crush terrorism, the potential now is unprecedented. The problem we deal with is, by and large, people are affected by all of these means of social control, including fear a new McCarthyism, a new McCarthyism targeting Putin, uh, et cetera. I pose once again the challenge to all of us. We know very well the nature of the enemy operations, the British imperial operations. We know they are vulnerable, weak as never before. They can be taken down now. Victories in the recent period presage that, indicate that. Uh, and if we do our work, if we act, willfully as we are capable. Manhattan Project, a leadership of the United States, a reestablishment of a functional presidency, which actually took some steps forward in the Berlin Conference. If we do that, then the, a very fascinating world economic development and renaissance is immediately ours for the taking. That's what I put on the table. Floor is, floor is open for questions. Okay. Uh, the, the late Colonel Prouty, also known as Colonel X, uh, from the JFK movie with, um, directed by Oliver Stone, compared the assassination of uh, Harrahausen with that of JFK himself. Um, kind of in terms of how we view these things, it seems like we stop at the assassination. Um, like the, the, the way that we understand somebody like JFK or Herrhausen is by studying the assassination, not the person, not, not the reason why they would be killed in the first place. So can you give uh, kind of a snapshot or a de in, in detail view of, of who Herrhausen was and, and what he was trying to do? Actually, let me begin by going back to the Kennedy assassination. Uh, the intent of the Kennedy assassination was to destroy a Rooseveltian process in America and internationally. LaRouche created this movement beginning 1965, soon after the Kennedy assassination, when LaRouche saw the implications for the American and world economy and for this new paradigm, uh, the hegemony of the transatlantic financial institutions, monetarism, 
cultural pessimism, despair, the drug rock sex counterculture, LaRouche saw the implications of that and launched this movement as a leadership. I reference that because at the point at which Herrhausen was murdered, uh, in November of 1989, LaRouche, who had been imprisoned by Bush and company, LaRouche had already put forward the future in the form of the European Productive Triangle, which then became the Eurasian Land Bridge. Uh, and the development of institutions internationally, an international leadership, which was capable of countering the devastation caused by the Herrhausen assassination. To your question, Herrhausen had, uh, on a number of occasions, put forward a LaRouchean conception of a post-communist era. Remember, what LaRouche was doing with the SDI with Reagan was working to bring U.S and the Soviet Union together in a post-Cold War world around scientific, a science driver, around a revolution in science, in economics, in culture, in statecraft. LaRouche, Herrhausen had called for prior, well, prior to his assassination, but he was about to call for on December 4th in a speech to be given in New York, he had called for an end to this IMF regime of genocide against the third world by opening up the potential to write off the unpayable and illegitimate debt of third world countries, of Poland, of former Soviet bloc countries, and so on. And he had called for a, a KFW type institution, the Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau, the institution which was developed in Germany in the post-war period by Herrhausen's predecessor, Hermann Ops, uh, in building a credit institution which would deploy credit in a directed fashion into the physical economy, as opposed to what the London crowd, the Wall Street crowd did after Kennedy was killed, uh, after 71 and the end of Bretton Woods, when they opened up the floodgates and turned the financial system into a global casino, as opposed to a banking system oriented toward humanity, oriented toward physical development, scientific progress, agro-industrial development, and so on. Herrhausen had already put this forward. That's why he was killed, that you had this incredible moment of history of great optimism when the wall came down, the unthinkable had happened. LaRouche thought it in his speech in Berlin, October 12th, 1988. He thought it, he forecast it. People said, this is, where's this coming from? When's that gonna happen? Well, it happened a year later. And at that point, you had this extraordinary wave of optimism, the communist, uh, uh, dictatorship over many countries was over. Germany was reunified. The potential for a, a new Germany allied with potentially Russia and with these countries, that potential was there. And Lynn, from prison, really the day or the day after the Berlin Wall came down, Lynn put forward the idea of this European productive triangle, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, as a, 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 a wellspring of industrial and economic power to deploy east into Poland and east from there. Uh, and essentially what was done was uh, an operation to prevent that from occurring by removing Herrhausen, who was a leading advisor to Chancellor Kohl, uh, and forcing Kohl into the straitjacket, which became Maastricht and the Euro system forcing coal to give up a sovereign cur currency and the sovereignty of a, new, of, of a newly unified Germany and accept this European Union. Well, look at the European Union now without, without going through this whole history. Um, but what, again, what, had it, what came into existence by the power of reason was an idea which has now flourished as the new Silk Road. Uh, and and the, again, the challenge which Lynn and Helga have on the table is in the last weeks they have posed the revival of Herrhausen's vision as the essence of banking, of Deutsche Banking, of the, of the policy of Deutsche Bank, Herrhausen's bank, and the essence of banking in Europe and the United States, industrial banking, banking tied to the uh, common, uh, to the general welfare, to the common interests of humanity through directed credit into the agro-industrial system. That's now on the table as the European banking system, including Deutsche Bank, uh, is disintegrating. That's what I would say. Uh, 
uh, there's been speculation over the centuries that there may be intelligent life in other parts of our universe. Since we're exploring now, it seems more likely than ever, perhaps people are coming from other parts of the universe and perhaps they're avoiding our planet for some reason or another, we don't know why, but uh, shouldn't we preparing our planet as we would our house for guests, getting it clean and orderly so that we aren't looked on as a disorderly house Well, that would take some house cleaning if you want to prepare the planet. I don't know. Anyhow, we know where the intelligent life is on this planet. and We know that there are locations where there's no such intelligent life. What I would stress is that the, if, you, if you take seriously, if you look and conceptualize the four laws, which LaRouche put forward two years ago, uh, that the, the essence of this is the, that which distinguishes mankind from animals and from any other species. And this is a, this quality of, of mind, of noesis, of the creative capacity of mankind to discover, to discover new physical principles, to create in terms of uh, classical culture and so on. That the capacity of mankind to create new modes of existence that once you eliminate the zero growth ideology, the zero growth dogmas, which came in in this paradigm shift to hell in the 60s and 70s, and which has created zero growth. That is in the United States now, there is zero growth. Jack Lou takes pride in this somehow or other. Unlike China and a handful of countries which are in terms of uh, what's called total factor productivity, Productivity, which is a function of technological progress, where the growth is three, three and a half percent. There is zero growth in Europe and the United States in productivity. And if you eliminate the zero growth dogma and you open your mind with the vision of a Croft Erica, with the vision of the Apollo project, of what Kennedy brought into being, and so on and so forth. If you say that mankind's home is in this universe, and in terms of the capacity of mankind to conceptualize the, the new, to conceptualize what mankind has never experienced, to conceptualize what might be out there, and to proceed to explore, as in the Apollo Project, as in what the Chinese are committed to doing now, in terms of their mission, coming mission, to the far side of the moon. If that's what man is doing on this planet, then I think we will have created the potential for these people you, or whatever, these people you are concept, or you're, or you're hypothesizing, perhaps they'll come down here. Anyhow, the point is we can clean up the planet by virtue of a commitment to explore others. Uh, earlier this week, Mike Steger was, uh, involved in a discussion with the policy committee and he posed the question if Filippo Brunelleschi's dome, the Florentine dome, which was begun in 1420 and was completed in 1436, if the dome had collapsed, would there have been a renaissance? It's a very interesting question because of course the dome is simply the completion of a cathedral it didn't have any apparent so-called material use. It was for the worship of Christians and hopefully a unified Christian church. But in at least Mike Steger's question, something's implied because of course the Renaissance and the way in which human creativity and productivity erupted in the period of the Renaissance. That's the watershed point that Lyndon LaRouche has continually referred to uh, throughout his entire career in terms of the sudden upshift, the most powerful upshift in human history. 
in potential relative population density. That is to say that at that point, and not earlier, from anything we know, did the human race suddenly experience a kind of shift in creativity and productivity that was unprecedented up to that point. This idea that the dome being built was the cause of the greatest economic, scientific, and technological productivity in human history. It's a very interesting question. And I would just say that the reason that I would take what was just posed and look at it from that standpoint might be best indicated by something that Keisha Rogers pointed out. And she pointed this out, I believe, yesterday on the, uh, or in the, in the course of the uh, discussions that have happened at least in the last couple of days. She pointed out that the LaRouche Four Laws don't have anything to do with economic reforms in the way in which people are thinking. She pointed out that the Four Laws are all about building a future that has never existed. So our idea of Glass-Steagall, for example, is it's not an economic reform. We're not trying to do something to uh, rebalance the books of the present economy in any way. And even when we say, well, it's the same as what Roosevelt did in 1933, actually it couldn't possibly be the same. Simply, it's as honest as what Roosevelt did in 1433. And that's the idea. The 21st century Glass-Steagall they're talking about, we're not entirely clear what is meant by, for example, a Hillary Clinton or someone else about that. But what we are clear about is that our conception and Lynn's conception of his four laws are identical to the, 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 the idea content of what Brunelleschi did in the creation of that dome. I think it's something that people should think about because it doesn't seem that that action itself built the economy of Europe. We can say many things about the technological breakthroughs. We can say many things about the scientific uh, principles that had to be mastered to do it. Yes, that's all true. But the intent behind completing the dome was to do it, in fact, for the greater glory of God. as Bach said of his compositions. Now, why is that a principle of physical economy? And what does that have to do with potential life on other planets? Beethoven answered that in the Ode to Joy. It's right there. It's written right there. And I would suggest people take a look, actually just listen to the piece. It's a good way for you to, uh, to bribe you anyway, to go and listen to it. Because you'll see that Beethoven discusses this precisely in Ode to Joy. So it's, this, this, it's a group of principles that Lynn has introduced uh, uniquely into uh, uh, economics, really after Gottfried Leibniz, whose 300th anniversary of whose birth, a uh, death, excuse me, 1716, is uh, being commemorated around the world. And it's something I think people should try to just think about to see how the ideas that Lynn is describing and are being promoted and discussed by our policy committee each week, they're significantly different than it might appear. Hi, it's Lizzie. Okay, so Thursday evening, the Schiller Institute, together with a Puerto Rican organization, hosted a classical music concert in East Harlem with the Schiller Chorus and prominent operatic singers performing. Now, this opportunity was opened up by a guy from the area, an area where you generally don't find any classical music performances, and mostly mambo salsa stuff. 
but he's someone who was trained as a tenor when he was young by someone who worked with Caruso and he went over to romantic music because there was no money in the classical music and no response from the surroundings. Now it is interesting that there was a certain resistance uh, to our concert up to it, but after the concert's success, even people who had been opposed to the concert were ecstatic about it and eager to have us perform another concert in the area. So what do you think uh, that this says about the potential in the Manhattan organizing and what is the importance of this way of organizing in our political fight? At the point at which the, um, <clears throat> the Russian-Syrian offensive crushed ISIS in Palmyra, about three months ago, two months ago. People will remember what Putin and uh, his associates did in Palmyra. Now, what was the point of a classical concert on that amphitheater after ISIS had desecrated that place, uh, but upon a military strategic advance by the, by the combined Russian-Syrian force? is that what Putin was doing was putting forward the classical beauty, was the amongst the greatest in the Bach Chacon and so on, amongst the greatest of Western classical compositions, creations, was putting that forward as an indicator of what it, what it is that he and the Russians and these Syrian forces are fighting for. It's well known who they're fighting against. But what are they fighting for? We are similarly organizing in the, in the context of this, if it, we, we had at the Berlin conference, uh, this concert with a Russian children's chorus, with a Chinese choir, with um, uh, the classical string orchestra at the Verdi tuning from uh, England, uh, a, I think a Syrian chorus, Ukrainian singers, uh, and our own Schiller chorus with the Coronation Mass. And we celebrated the new paradigm and advanced the new paradigm in a, in a, in a unique fashion with that concert. So we're looking at a process which will flower. We've been building this up in, in the current EIR, which most people here have, I think, look at the interview with Diane, who initiated this Manhattan Project choral process. Look at her interview in there as she addresses the living memorial, which comes together on the weekend of 9-11 with the four concerts. Dennis is actually organizing this at the core of organizing, and he may have more to elaborate on that. But I think that insofar as the principles on which Lyndon LaRouche organized the Manhattan Project, the Hamilton Principle, which is embedded in the Four Laws, and the Choral Principle, if you will, which is embedded in the Four Laws, that what we are working toward is a flowering of this process. Most people here are involved in that process. If you're not, you ought to be. Uh, because the, effectively, this is the access, the best, most important, most efficient access we have to our humanity, which is to perform Mozart, or the kind of thing which was performed in East Harlem in the concert that you just referenced. And that, um, we're, we're performing a week from tomorrow. Uh, the Schiller Chorus will be participating in a... Uh, an event upstate New York focused on Verdi. Uh, that this is effectively our humanity and as we engage in this, we build this project by accessing that quality of culture and that quality of humanity. Our potential on this is limitless. I'll say, uh, one thing in addition. Uh, 
some people know that at the uh, concert in Palmyra, uh, the first piece played was the Bach Chacon. It's a uh, it's, it's a part of his partita in violin, uh, partita in uh, D minor. It's solo. It's violin. And uh, if you remember what had happened there. This is a place of execution. Several people have been executed by ISIS. Last week in France, an 84-year-old Catholic priest saying mass, very few people in the church, and he was executed in the process of saying mass. On July 20th, a 12-year-old boy was executed in Syria by the associates of Barack Obama. That is to say, the people that the United States is presently supporting in the uh, situation in Syria that Putin is trying to clear up. Now, when you look at that performance, which I suggest people take a look at in Palmyra and look at that performance of the Chacon, I think it's a good idea to think about how to place that same voice in the, in the throats of our singers when we perform the Requiem. Because it's exactly the same. Now, this is the most powerful thing you can do in politics. Because politics in general is a disgusting affair not because it's disgusting or the idea of politics is disgusting, but because the kind of principles that Alexander Hamilton brought to play in the case of the American Revolution are generally discarded because the, the idea of the education of a population, such as was done with the Federalist Papers by Hamilton and Jay and others, and what was done by Governor Morris, his friend, with respect to the preamble of the Constitution. He's the person that wrote the preamble. That idea takes a conception of humanity that at the core of it believes in the idea that humanity is not only precious, but that the ability to love people and to allow them to express their creativity in the worst conditions of oppression, in the worst conditions of brutality, and even in the conditions where they are dead, you can allow humanity to express itself even when it is dead. Because humanity is not dead. The individual's dead. And so what we are doing, and what the idea is of what we did, including in Harlem, this is a community in which, when we, when we performed there, they said to us, this is the first time this has happened here. We have not heard this kind of music, classical music, performed here before. That surprised many of our organizers. It also delighted some of us because it was good to know that we had done this. And the gratitude that was felt wasn't gratitude toward us. It's, it's the idea that there is a humanity that is higher, that people are born for something better, as Schiller said, and that when you assert it using the vehicle of music, then you've employed a capability that's dormant but is available. It's creativity. It's what Lynn talks about as creativity. And what we're doing on things like Glass-Steagall or what we're doing with respect to Keisha's campaign for the space program is identical to what we're doing in this, in this regard. I think it's just important for people to understand that it's an Irinyi's principle. It's the idea that you can make justice speak, though murder would prefer the opposite. So that the kind of murderous speeches we heard, for example, at the Democratic Convention, and the murderous speeches that we heard at the Republican Convention, don't have to speak for America. We can speak for America. We're completely free to do that. And the Manhattan Project is about a refutation of that America that is being portrayed falsely by these characters. 
and it's about a resurrection of Alexander Hamilton's America in favor, not merely of the United States, but the world as a whole and the humanity of all of us in general. Uh, Rick from Bergen County, New Jersey. On, on the uh, Deutsche Bank uh, issue that there's been a lot of discussion of, is the issue really about Deutsche Bank? I mean, the, uh, there's uh, talk of uh, putting into place the four principles, uh, the credit bank and uh, Glass-Steagall and so forth, and raising everything to a higher level. But uh, is Deutsche, I mean, and, and we also realize that Deutsche Bank is, um, crumbling. I mean, it's, it looks like it's about to, to blow and uh, thereby take down a lot of other uh, parts of the financial system. But is the institution of Deutsche Bank, aside from its legacy back to the Herrhausen uh, person, is, is it a, as a structural edifice, per se, relevant? I mean, isn't that issue really about, not really about uh, bailing out uh, Deutsche Bank at all, but really to construct a new form of uh, a new principle, uh, you know, uh, along the lines of the four laws. Remember the, um, the, the context for the Deutsche Bank proposal, which is to say that uh, this came about the same day or a couple of days after the NATO summit which NATO summit was an expression of this dying desperate empire to intensify their commitment to destroy Russia, Russia and China. So I would think number one, insofar as uh, Lynn operates in terms of metaphor, that the Deutsche Bank question has served and serves now as a metaphor for a transformation, an urgent transformation at this moment of history. As you know, you have a 20th century, century of war, in which the centerpiece of British imperial strategy was to throw um, geopolitically Germany at Russia, Russia at Germany, in two world wars and in a cold war. Uh, and if that were to occur again or intensify in the immediate period, then you're dealing with nuclear holocaust. How do you overcome that? Let me, let me take two things. Dennis and I had the opportunity to talk to Lynn this morning, and we asked about Putin, and he said Putin's role is perfectly clear. If you look at his performance as a leader in society, he's the most consistent person in the whole game. At the same time, he draws support from other people that are leaders who are trying to work through solutions. Putin is the expert in, present, in, in presenting or producing solutions, and you want his view to come forth in this situation to explain things. Anything that he has to deal with, this guy is straight and clever at the same time. I know him in various ways. He goes for the issues that he knows to be important, and he's usually right. When he's not right, he makes himself right pretty fast. Now, I say this here, because what Lynn and Helga are shaping with the Deutsche Bank proposal, how do you take Germany, which is facing hell, were this institution to bring down the European banking system? The you know very well the counterparty um, exposure of the major too big to fail banks of Wall Street in Europe to Deutsche Bank in terms of 73 trillion in derivatives exposure. Therefore, if this institution blows up at any point, that will either bring down the banking system in a disorderly, chaotic uh, collapse with devastating economic effects, genocide, and will very likely lead rapidly to nuclear war. Because that's the game which the British Empire is committed to playing. Or we will have the rapid implementation of the four laws of a Glass-Steagall orientation, for example, initially with Deutsche Bank, since uh, uh, Lynn and Helga proposed this, there apparently is discussion internal to that bank about some kind of separation, commercial as opposed to investment banking separation. You have the Handelsblatt 
endorsement, the leading financial paper of Germany endorsing Glass-Steagall. You have the emplacement of Glass-Steagall in the two-party platforms. So that it, Lynn and Helga have catalyzed something, I think, which opens up a great potential to actually stabilize that institution and a banking system based on the Harehausen principle. If that's the issue. Uh, that's the relevant issue I institution which can bring the thing down or which could be a turning point in the right direction. And if you combine that with what is happening with the T20, what China is doing, what Putin is doing, Putin has called for Eurasian economic, uh, he's taking the Eurasian economic union, which the Russians initiated, and saying, let us bring this into the new Silk Road. Let us create one space from the Atlantic to the Pacific, to, to paraphrase de Gaulle on this. Putin is doing that with the Chinese under the conceptual leadership of Lin and Helga. That was what the Berlin Conference is about. That's what we're moving toward in terms of the UN General Assembly. Because the issue of Putin's international alliance to crush terrorism, is the, it, this is one and the same with the issue of Glass-Steagall, but Glass-Steagall doesn't exist by itself. It's the issue of the four laws. It's the issue of the reestablishment of a human economy. Yeah, go. Um, but is Deutsche Bank itself, given its uh, sordid history recently of criminal activity, its uh, undefinable uh, book of derivatives, et cetera, et cetera, is that a mechanism that could actually be used to yeah. do this? Let me just say something about that. That's precisely why we're doing it. Because remember, the Deutsche Bank is presently right now a British bank. I mean, essentially, particularly it's a London derivatives uh, section, is what bankrupted the bank. So if you make this proposal, particularly at a point when the British situation itself is destabilized by several circumstances, there's Brexit, and there's also the Chilcot report. There's also the attack on HSBC. So what's actually going on here, you also have to remember, by the way, that where was Putin stationed when he was in, in KGB? Germany. He knows Germany better than virtually anybody in Russia. He speaks German fluently and so forth. What's the history with respect to Germany and Russia? Well, we've talked about the Bismarck reference before. We're not going to go through all that. But what's going on is that Lyndon LaRouche has been at nonstop war with the British, as I think everybody knows you know, for decades. Hmm? The problem involved is that generally he doesn't have allies that are willing to win that fight. Mo most people are not willing to win that fight. You know, Putin is a guy that knows, for example, the history right, of things like the Chechen conflict. That's not a history that began in the 1990s with the two Chechen wars. This goes back to the time, as I mentioned before, of Imam Shamil in Dagestan, when, when Queen Victoria was supporting Shamil and the others in the war against Russia, the Crimean War, of course, in 18, 1859, but earlier than that, in the 1830s and 40s. The, 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 what, what he understands is the deep structure, the British deep structure from the time of the East India Company. You also have to just remember, just in general, Putin and some other people also in Russia, actually, they're intellectuals. They actually think about what Lin is doing. See, Lin is not <laughs> the... the <laughs> The, the figure that he's been painted to be in America, which, by the way, many of our own people believe him to be. He's not that. Lynn is the leading uh, physical economist in the world and recognized as such by the Russians ever since at least 1991 by other people in Russia earlier. So what's going on here is that the, you know, Lynn has talked about the flank in the mind continually. Lynn is engaged in a war. He intends to win it. He thinks if he can get some cooperation from us and some others, he can win it. And often what happens is the people don't get that the way he's doing things is at a level of grand strategy, which is accessible only if you can understand the ideas of people like Einstein or Leibniz or Beethoven or Bach. But the reason we do what we do with the chorus, the reason we do what we do with the dialogues and other things, and the reason our, our basement team is so important is because this is an accessible method which is being used by a few people in the world that can actually understand the world the way Lynn does, and Putin is one of those people.
So the concept of the Deutsche Bank flank is very clear. Uh, it's not really up to Deutsche Bank as such. There's a crisis, and there's only one way out if you want to survive. So, you know, if you've got a mechanic and nobody likes him, but the car is broken, they go get the mechanic to fix the car. And Lyndon LaRouche is more than a mechanic. Hey, thank you. Hi, Lynn here. Um, one year ago, here in New York at the United Nations, uh, Putin spoke and called for a international collaboration to eliminate the scourge of terrorism. He, of course, began to proceed to do exactly that, and we've already talked about that with respect to what has occurred in Syria and other locations. Unfortunately, that met a deaf ear and a blind eye uh, by the U.S. administration. In September of 2005, similarly, Putin, uh, just four years after 9-11, spoke at a historic groundbreaking ceremony. And the ceremony was to dedicate to the victims of 9-11 a huge monument which is called the Teardrop Memorial, which is dedicated to the struggle against world terrorism. That's the actual name of the, of the uh, statue. And um, at the groundbreaking ceremony, uh, Putin again reiterated this commitment, which really he had made clear in the moments after the events of 9-11 in his call to famous call to Bush and so on, and Clinton in a short um, inaugural uh, address. The statue, by the way, is right in Bayonne, New Jersey, and it's a hundred foot tall bronze monument. Uh, it's fractured from the top to the bottom with the intention of creating a kind of tension which is modulated by a single teardrop which resonates inside a very, very painful uh, wound. So Putin said at the inaugural, in brief, we are here today to lay the cornerstone of a memorial dedicated to the victims of the September 11th terrorist attack in 2001. At that time, four years ago, the criminals thought they would plunge America and all civilized humanity into chaos. They were wrong. On the contrary, we have become more unified than ever, and we created an actively functioning anti-terrorist coalition. I fully agree with you, Mr. Mayor, he said, addressing the mayor of, of, um, of Bayonne, just as we vanquish fascism, we shall, so shall we defeat terrorism together. One year later, when the inaugural, when the memorial was completed, uh, President, former President Clinton spoke and echoed the same sentiments on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of those tragic events where he talked about such an international dialogue of civilization based on peace and love. So I think it's altogether fitting that at the upcoming concert sponsored by the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture, in which the Schiller Institute Chorus will be participating, that we have chosen to use as our uh, for the poster for that concert, the emblem of the Teardrop Memorial. And there are more of these which people can get a closer uh, look at. So it sits in Bayonne, New Jersey. It is directly between the Statue of Liberty and the former uh, World Trade Center towers. And as you come in by ship, 
as many immigrants did, of course, historically, where you would see the Statue of Liberty, you now see this tower, which is really in the same, I think, very much the same image uh, or spirit as the Statue of Liberty, the fight against tyranny, the fight against oligarchism. It is also a very sublime and fitting reminder of what Lynn said to us several weeks ago when this issue came up of a idea of a memorial or a tribute for the 9-11 victims. And Lynn said, you have to have a living memorial. And he elaborated that what he meant by that is you have to evoke a sense of guilt in the population, a sense of remorse of which the physical representation of that is precisely the idea of tears, pangs of, of remorse, which is, a, which is both a recognition of what has not been done up to this point in terms of, of getting at the truth behind 9-11 and the justice for those victims, but it's also very much a resolve that that is going to be changed there's a recognition and there's a resolve of changing it. And that is really the sentiment, I think, by which in which we are performing this uh, historic, magnificent work of Mozart's uh, Requiem on the occasion of September 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, four concerts. So I think this, this spirit this affect, this emotional and both political idea of the world coming together in, in a res new resolve and a new commitment, particularly coming off of our victory with the 28 pages, that we go into this next six weeks and organize um, like the Dickens uh, around this idea. Finally, I just want to say is one of the profound ironies is as we've talked to people about this 9-11 memorial, everybody's mouth has dropped open because it's been totally suppressed. Nobody knows that this towering memorial even exists. Uh, so tomorrow morning, for those of you who would like to join us at 1030, we'll be going over to actually see the memorial, uh, and uh, you're, you're all welcome to come. But I'd like you to comment on that, and particularly on uh, perhaps developing Lynn's idea of this quality of the sublime that we have to evoke in this period to prick the conscience of our fellow Americans. Dennis referenced the occasion this year of the it's the uh, <clears throat> 300th 370th anniversary of the birth of Gottfried Leibniz the 300th anniversary of the death of Leibniz Leibniz develops this co conception which you're alluding to which I think is at the core of this and needs to be at the core of our outlook which is to say that under conditions of, of, of great evil that mankind has this capacity, call it agape, this capacity for love in such a way that you can generate a greater good than the evil and the effects of that evil. I think that's what we're, I think that's, that's the guiding principle which underlies what we're into, what you've just developed. I want to take one thing that came up over this week on Leibniz and come back to this point is that you had an international congress in Hanover where Leibniz was based for much of his life um, 440 scientists from 32 countries uh, and in this congress the China-born specialist on Leibniz at the University of Hanover said for our own happiness or the happiness of others we can only be happy if others are happy too. What it is about is human beings, other cultures. It is about the common good of all. And then a second figure at the, at the conference said, if you look at the theme of this Congress, 
it implies that also in his academy projects for the various countries, he saw no benefit in progress, which occurs at the expense of other countries. But in his striving for harmony, he was convinced that there will always be a mutual benefit for all. Uh, what the Chinese, what, Xin, what uh, Xi Jinping has put forward is a conception, that conception, which he calls, or it's translated as win-win, is the harmony which is inherent in a mankind based on agape, based on a commitment to the general welfare principle, the commitment to justice, is that in that kind of universe, the capacity for mankind to overcome this kind of the, the evil which you see in Palmyra, which you see in Nice. I mean, what comes to mind, picking up on what Dennis referenced earlier on this, is that hours or days after the Nice massacre, you had a performance of the Beethoven Ninth. This was in Munich? Munich. Munich. Uh, which was, this is in, in the shadow of Nice. And what people who saw this described as an extraordinary performance of Beethoven's Ninth. Think of the principles that Schiller and Beethoven bring to bear in that. Those, I think, are the, the principles underlying the commitment, the living memorial idea, which is not merely to memorialize the 2,977 who perished on that day, but to commit ourselves to bring into being the greater good in such a way that the, the perpetuation of this evil for centuries by the British Empire can be ended in such a way that we bring this Schillerian, Leibnizian world into being. Okay, next question. Next. Who's next? Good afternoon. I'm Patrick from Coscop. Greenwich is compromised. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a week ago, uh, when I was here, we had uh, a uh, discussion about the the signatures, uh, the uh, petition. So I uh, that was one of the orders that I got. So uh, what I did was I got uh, about ten of my friends, and I gave them each five of these. Uh, pamphlets or the petitions and I said look next Thursday which just passed I, I will pick them up now all you have to do is get the signature and tell them what it's for it's about the 28 pages that were classified and so on and so forth and they said oh, the, you know I'm on it so uh, I, I kept in touch but then you know things got out of control so I made a promise uh, to myself. I said, you know, every day I'm going to get, I'm going to have one sheet filled. And I figured, you know, with all the others coming in, I'd have a tremendous amount of signatures. So unfortunately, uh, they, they failed. But uh, for six days, I have 84 signatures. And I have a, a check made out to the LaRouche Pack, a donation in the, in the process. So I, I would like to tell everybody that's trying to get signatures, don't, don't even think about hurting feelings. Because if you think about that, you'll never get a signature. And if somebody says, no, I don't want to sign it, that's OK. There's, there's a thousand more that, you know, are out there. But keep on going. And I learned something from the call. And uh, Jeff Steinberg said uh, to me that uh, persistence and focus. And that's what you need. And we can, we can do miracles. We have. And then when, they're, when everything's settled, then I'm, I'll get them into music. <laughs> and that's uh, my report for this week.
We should work on a, a, a challenge to for the entire Manhattan Project to get 84 signatures in the next week or 840 signatures, whatever. We can come back to this perhaps in the implementation. But you, you, you mentioned Jeff Steinberg. I was talking to him the other day. Uh, and he, or in a discussion he had with some of us the other day, he emphasized that prior to the Berlin conference a month ago, that he and Helga had done some meetings with people to develop, to, to work through the most efficient means of making these people, some of whom are prominent people, very uncomfortable in such, because the subject was how do they come to the next level, to the next higher level in terms of their identity, in terms of their political commitment, in terms of their political effectiveness, And there was a particular case of an individual who he and Helga had met with on a number of occasions. And based on the meeting that they had, I presume in June, this individual addressed the Berlin Conference. Unprecedented. That is, he was on a podium with Lynn and Helga for the first time, a public podium. Um, and it turns out that after he gave his speech, which had certain problems to it, but which ended with a, uh, with a very, very important discussion of the new Silk Road as the unique solution to the problem of geopolitics, which to one degree or other he was trapped in, that he proceeded immediately to send out this speech to an email list of 2,000 people. And the people involved, this is a, a figure, an important figure within the institution of the U.S. presidency a guy with a long diplomatic career, intelligence community, et cetera. So he sent out his speech from the Schiller Institute conference on the podium with Lyndon and Helga LaRouche for the first time um, uh, to this whole network, th thousands of, of, an, of prominent Americans. Now, I, I take this because what Patrick keeps doing is he keeps overcoming a certain fear, like he described last time when you went to the firehouse and these guys said, get out of here. We're, we're not, we're not going to get involved in this. We're not supposed to be political. And you described from the town halls in Connecticut and from the firehouse, it appeared as if there was some McCarthyite clamp that had been imposed that we're not going to talk about this, we're, you know, et cetera. And it may well have been imposed in this social control environment that I was alluding, alluding to before. But you said when you, as you were leaving the firehouse and these guys said, get out of here, you said, no, I'm not leaving. This is too important. We're talking about your comrades who were murdered in the towers. And we're talking about hundreds of other firemen and policemen and first responders. We're talking about thousands of Americans. And we're fighting this. And we've been fighting this for many years. And we are now winning. We're turning a corner on this thing. And we have to consolidate this victory over the next couple of months. We're, assuming Putin speaks at the UN again, at, let's say late September, a year on from the, the September 28th speech at the UN General Assembly last year when he proposed a World War II style, a US-Soviet alliance of 70 years ago against Hitler, which succeeded, and he posed something along those lines for this moment of history. Let's assume he's back at the UN. He was in St. Petersburg a couple of days ago at a conference of Russian security services, law enforcement, and he put the conception forward again, as he put that conception forward in Bayonne, on the, in, it, it's, it, in that speech that Lynn described. As he put that forward, at least implicitly, a couple of hours after 9-11, on 9-11, when Lyndon LaRouche was on the Stockwell show, responding in real time, to this unprecedented attack on America and Americans, and Lynn pointed to the international force, which had to be behind this, and the domestic inside assistance. And a couple of hours later, Putin was the first head of state who contacted Bush, President Bush, and said, look, we're standing down. We're taking our military and our nuclear capability. We're standing down because we want you to know we had nothing to do with this. 
And implicitly, we want to work with America to organize an international capability to crush terrorism. That was at least implicit in what he said on 9-11, and then he's developed it now on these series of occasions. I'm saying this to people here because the kind of thing when Patrick overcomes his fear and just fearlessly says, hey, look, I've known you for 10 years or 50 years, you're in my family or my friends, firemen, whatever, or I've never met you before, but you should sign this thing. You should read this pamphlet. You should contribute to LaRouche Pack. I do say this is exemplary. And that if we had 50 or 100 people in Manhattan who were doing that, the Manhattan Project would be qualitatively, dramatically transformed. And that is what we need between now and 9-11. And as of the weekend of 9-11, and as of the uh, General Assembly coming together. Because where it, look, what, what, exactly what is Deutsche Bank going to do, or, you know, the, the bankers and the depositors in Germany and in America, what are they going to do as the system blows up? Go down with it, go to, go to, go to hell? I could go through the bailout, the bail-in, all this crap of the last eight years and what, what London and Wall Street are thinking about doing. It's genocide. It's world war. They have an option. They have an alternative. We've brought it into being. And we have a job to, as, as the, uh, you know, we held a commission, this one, last November. And we have a lot of these out here. People should be taking this. The U.S. joins the new Silk Road. That's the question. Is this going to be an orderly transformation back to Hamilton and forward to LaRouche? Or is it going to be hell? So the kind of thing Patrick's getting at here in terms of that petition or this pamphlet or the next pamphlets we should be putting out, we're going to have the Berlin rep uh, full report on the Berlin conference available in about a week, the entire transcripts of it. This is extraordinary ammunition. But it's very much up to the Manhattan Project to lead the country, the activists here, to lead the nation, and in that sense, in the world, to consolidate this process as Helga defined the process in Berlin and again a couple of days ago in Beijing. Uh, hi, Alvin here. Um, I'm happy to follow Patrick because uh, I was appropriately embarrassed last week to not be able to say that I had done any work on the uh, petition. And so I, too, decided to actually do some organizing this week around that. Uh, and what I did was I talked to now not my so-called contacts about this, but this seemed to be uh, a perfect opportunity to talk to people that I know, but that are so-called not political, which means that they're in desperate need of the ability to think. And this pamphlet, or uh, this uh, petition, once you actually start to use it, it's when the, it becomes more than information and you see the power of what you're holding in your hands. Um, sure, on the surface, uh, at its lightest levels, 3,000 people died. Uh, this r report was suppressed. We should get this out and tell people. But that's not what this uh, petition saying. It's saying a lot more, including solutions. And it, if you're thinking, is going to create a certain amount of tension in the person and see that we're not just having a good rally, just like we're not just having a concert, uh, to have music, but that there's something else going on. So now the possibility of them thinking. And these are people that I would never talk to about anything we're doing, including music, but the uh, occasion of 9-11, uh, the Chilcot Report, the BRICS pamphlet and so on, opens all of this up. Now, I'm not saying that things went hunky-dory and smooth with people, because the deeper you go, the more nervous they become. They signed a pamphlet, but they don't want any contact information. They're not, they said, let's, let's just leave it at that. But that's not the point. The point is now they're thinking, and I'm urging them. They say they will. It's funny how long 28 pages can be, uh, and I think they're going to find it very long. But now I've opened something up that did not otherwise exist. 
and uh, will continue to do so to expand our network. You know, last week I was here, but apparently I wasn't in Manhattan. This week I was, and that's what I can tell you. Um, well, I, I just want to say one thing concerning this issue of deployment. Uh, fear walks the United States. And uh, I, I want to, at least at this point, compliment people on the fact they were restrained enough, maybe not, maybe actually uh, properly occupied mentally, because we haven't been getting any questions on the idiocy of these conventions. Now, now there's something important about the idiocy of the conventions, which is fear. And both conventions trafficked in nothing but fear. The issue of the circulation of the petition and the issue of what we are doing, especially when people are going on and you're actually talking to people, because everybody knows that's what the fear is. You talk to strangers, or you talk to people who aren't strangers but are. People you think you know very well, but they actually don't know anything about you nor you them. Hmm? And you've kept this thing comfortable because it's easier to do. Um, so everyone is whistling past the graveyard, but they don't realize they're all in the graveyard. In fact, they're in the grave. So they're whistling in the grave. So in, in, in the course of, of, of uh, life, sometimes it, get, it, be, it behooves one to get out of the grave. That's what the term renaissance means, okay? so to speak. Uh, I think what's important is, is, is that everyone can just think about how Lynn does this, because he does this all the time. Everybody knows that. And the issue is not just invoking his name, but his method. And his method is, you want to know what's going on, poke it with a stick. If you want to really understand what's going on in life, poke it with a stick. Then you'll see what's really happening. Uh, one of the things that everybody hears, right, we, Elliot reported it before, uh, well, you know, nothing is new in the 28 pages. Well, first of all, that's not true. But secondly, the actual fact of the matter is that it's interesting how little activity we are seeing right now in the United States in response to the release of the 28 pages. It's fear. If we act, we'll see a lot of activity. And I think this is the essential point, is that the action of the citizen, um, that the citizen knows that they have to take. People know what's right. They may, not, they may say they don't, but if someone such as ourselves is presenting what is right, they know that's right. But to get them to act, we have to act, but with confidence and also with a certain amount of humor. And uh, one of the things that Lynn suggested we do, let me see if I can just uh, reference this here quickly, is he said, uh, we need to talk to people about, we need to start a campaign for the edification of people. Who is the idiot of the week? He's referring to the two candidates in specific. Who is the idiot of the week? He said, because what's going to happen is each of these people is going to be saying things that are going to rankle people. They're going to say things that are stupid. Now, what we should be prepared to do is to go through this and then say, now, didn't you think that was stupid? And who this week is the idiot of the week? And it will alternate. By the way, don't leave out Jill Stein. She will also be the idiot of the week, although she's less important. Just reference that because some people are talking about this Green Party candidate. And of course, you know, it's a gangrene party. That's what it is. Hmm? So is this, this, is, this is not the future. Hmm? So uh, anyway, that's <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Hello, Jessica from uh, Brooklyn. Um, I, I'm inspired by Patrick, and um, I'm always inspired by Patrick, and I, I've been away for a while, and um, coming back and hearing about the petition that is being circulated by uh, our group, um, I'll have to jump in with both feet, and of course, it is a daunting task 
because you really do have to jump in. It's, it's more than just talking about it. So um, I've collaborated with a few people in our membership as to what we're going to do to get that done. So uh, there will be calls, there will be talking, there will be conference calls, things like that to kind of organize what we're going to do. And I will definitely be part of that uh, organizing. One of the other things that is inspiring, I came back from my little jaunt around the United States just recently with my daughter. And when I got back, my son presented me with a gift that he found at a street fair, uh, an African-American street fair. And the artwork that they had was called historical art, historical African-American art. And um, it jumped out at me and I'd like to show it to you. I just wanna you know, present that first because we've talked about Frederick Douglass and we've talked about the music of, uh, of the classical composers as part of the uh, thinking and the critical thinking in leadership. And this picture was given to me by my son And it says, this is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass's grandson. This was found at a street fair that my son went to. And I don't even know how much it was he purchased it for. I, I should ask him. <laughs> it says, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate and, and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without flowering up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. Frederick Douglass. And then at the bottom of it, it says, for it is through beauty that one proceeds to true freedom. Frederick Schiller. Wow. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah, so um, you, if you comment on that, uh, it's it's really inspirational. My wife designed that. <laughs> That's what that is. That's simply a blow up of our of one of the posters from one of our concerts from the '90s. <laughs> right, somebody took it to the In, uh, in the 1990s, we did a lot of work to create something called the National Conservatory of Music. It was a um, commemoration of an actual organization that was founded here in New York City uh, by a woman by the name of Jeanette Thurber. And in the course of, uh, of uh, the concerts that we gave, we were doing this around the, the death of Marian Anderson. But in the course of that, that's how we met Sylvia Olden Lee, and that's how people like Robert McFerrin and William Warfield, George Shirley, and many others began to work with us. So what Jessica has, somebody took our, actually it was much smaller, the program, I, I, oh no, that's probably one of the posters. We made posters. And apparently this made its way somehow to a street fair on African-American historical art. Without our attribution, I notice. Uh, <laughs> But that's all right. But that, that's OK. And uh, so nothing in the universe is accidental. Locke was wrong. Leibniz was right. There is no tabula rasa. <laughs> so I, I think if we, is that our, I think that's all the questions. So let's just get a summary from Elliot, and um, we'll move to the next section. Well, since it was your son who found this and presented it to you, it just proves again the underlying harmony of the universe. That <laughs> Kepler was right, and Leibniz was right, and Vernadsky and Einstein and LaRouche have been right about this. That's right. Well, all I would add is the, the um, 
I, I second Dennis's motion that this audience has been um, uh, appropriately um, full of foresight in not bringing up a series of questions about these conventions. Uh, what I would say about the, uh, the election campaign is all of this is the old paradigm, which is dead. You don't get caught up in this versus that. Lesser of evils, it's all evil. The old paradigm is evil and self-destroyed. And the great question, the challenge on the table for all of us is to rapidly organize this new paradigm, which is what Helga's been concentrating on of late. Uh, and that's what's on our plate for the weeks ahead. I'm sure anyone who has been going through the 28 pages has noticed that there is not one single page that doesn't have a blackout. So the question might be, well, we have a lot of information, some of which we already knew. But what's the secret underneath the black marks that we cannot see? and cannot read and cannot explain to others. The on this is that there are hundreds of thousands of pages which the FBI and company have. That's 28 pages. There are hundreds of thousands of pages, but it, in one, it's, which is relevant, and there is, there is intensifying activity to force this out in the open. Jeff Steinberg addressed a conference two days ago in Washington and discovered a lawyer's committee which is working to um, get state and federal grand juries investigations of all of that. This will, the cat's out of the bag. The Pandora's box has been opened up. We've done a job on this thing. So re redactions or not, the, 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 more, the more fundamental, the more important point here is to recognize that this is an expression of a dying empire whose time to go to hell has come. Uh, and, the, and we are, we are rapidly, as Helga again in Beijing this week, we are rapidly bringing this, uh, uh, this new economic order in the world, new dialogue of civilizations, this harmony back in this Leibnizian world into realization. And the, again, the, 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 I would urge all of you to recognize when, when the, as the explosions build in the period ahead, if we've done our job, over these weeks ahead, then people will increasingly gravitate toward the only available option, solution, which is what we've put on the table. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> but um, I deliberately watched the uh, the disgusting display of Hillary Clinton and her speech because I wanted to see what she was going to say, and I uh, you know I know that that can be very dangerous, but I really wanted to see what she was going to say and how stupid she would sound and what she would do, and leave out. But one of the things that was kind of humorous to me is that Trump came up with a statement uh, about the emails of Hillary, and I think everybody may have heard it, some people yeah. may not, okay. And he did give kudos to Putin. He said that uh, if you really wanna get to the bottom of the emails, with his you know, crazy self, uh, that you should get Putin to investigate the emails, and uh, then you might get somewhere. You might actually get a real investigation because these other clowns, don't know how to investigate anything, and they would find out the real dirt on Hillary. So I thought that was kind of cool. Even though Trump is a jackass, that was really kind of fun. So I just wanted to, to bring that in. <laughs> okay. I uh, think I'll take the op opportunity to transition us. Uh, this is from Charles McKay's 
uh, book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. In reading the history of nations, we find that, like individuals, they have their whims and their peculiarities, their seasons of excitement and recklessness when they care not what they do. We find that whole communities suddenly fix their minds upon one object and go mad in its pursuit, that millions of people become simultaneously impressed with one delusion and run after it till their attention is caught by some new folly more captivating than the first. We see one nation suddenly seize from its highest to its lowest members with a fierce desire of military glory. Another has suddenly become crazed upon a religious scruple and neither of them recovering its senses until it has shed rivers of blood and sowed a harvest of groans and tears to be reaped by its posterity. And then toward the end, he says, money has often been a cause of the delusion of multitudes. Sober nations have all at once become desperate gamblers and risked almost their existence upon the turn of a piece of paper. To trace the history of the most prominent of these delusions is the object of the present pages. Men, it has well been said, think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. We reject this idea. We reject the idea that people think in herds. We say that's not human. It's herd mentality. It's animal mentality. And our approach is completely different. We say that creativity is accessible, available, and is imperative. And that's what we insist upon in our conception of citizenship. I understand one of our members here is becoming a citizen. And I, I think we'll say a little bit more about that when we finish. Uh, the concept of citizenship we have is based upon the duty to be creative. That's the concept of citizenship. And all the other elements of that um, that people tend to associate with it are derivative. I, so I would just say that going back again to what we said about Lynn LaRouche, he's in Europe now, of course, and uh, you know other things are going on. Uh, there's a lot of discussion that's happening with, in many ways. He has invented a Manhattan Project. That's what you're all part of. And that Manhattan Project has to seek with less, with, with greater degree of perfection, I'll put it that way, or less degree of imperfection, to arrive at a new concept of citizenship that Americans carry out. I think the important idea is that no matter how deluded our fellow citizens may seem to be, the truth will set them free. And that's our ag ag agenda, that's our job, that's our directive. Know the truth and set them free.